uh, okay. Uh, I'll just share the screen. Uh, all right. Um, so, hello everyone. Uh, we are now starting the second lecture of the third and final day of the ninth Congress of Macroeconomics, organized by the Student Scientific Society of Finance and Macroeconomics at the Warsaw School of Economics and the Institute of Economic and Social Studies. Um, this also happens to be the last event of the Congress, and so after this lecture we will be officially closing the ninth Congress of Macroeconomics. Uh, today is dedicated to macroeconomic modeling, uh, an immensely important part of any environmental or ecological economics research. Uh, now, before I introduce our today's speaker, I would like to just quickly thank our patrons, uh, the European Parliament, the Rector of the Warsaw School of Economics, the Marshal of the Masowiecki Wojewodeship, the National Center for Research and Development, Polish Economic Society, Polish Economic Institute, Student Scientific Society of Econometrics, Observator Finansowy, and Magil for their patronage. Uh, I would also like to remind you about the contest uh, for the best article that is being organized together with Observator Finansowy, and more info can be found on our Facebook page. Um, this lecture is dedicated to state-of-the-art econometric climate modeling, and it will be held by our today's speaker, Dr. Dora Fazekas, uh, Dr. Fazekas heads up Cambridge Econometrics Budapest office. She specializes in the application of economic and econometric analysis to inform policymakers in the fields of climate and energy. Uh, she has 15 years experience successfully bridging academic research in climate change with policymaking and technology R&D. Uh, Dr. Dora Fazekas will present Cambridge Econometrics flagship E3ME model uh, E3ME is a macroeconometric model designed to assess global policy challenges. It is the most advanced econometric model in the world and is widely used for policy assessment, forecasting, and research purposes. The model is owned and maintained by Cambridge Econometrics. Uh, E3ME is a macroeconomic model that integrates a range of social and environmental processes. Uh, the two-way linkages between economy, wider society, and uh, global economic um, and economy environmental um, and environment are uh, key features of the model. Uh, it is designed to assess national and global economic and economic environment policy challenges, but can be applied to other policy areas due to its inbuilt adaptability. Uh, it has been used in policy areas as diverse as climate change, gender equality, and Brexit. Uh, Dr. Fazekas, we are honored to have you here, and we are extremely excited that you have agreed to uh, hold the lecture. Uh, so thank you once again, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, and thanks for the invitation as well, and uh, thanks for introducing me and uh, the company. And so now I will uh, try to share my screen. One second. Um, Please let me know if you can see the slides. Uh, it's loading, I think. Yeah, we now can see the um, sort of the, the presenter view. Yes. Okay. Now it's good. Uh, it cuts a little bit on the left side, but that should could be alright. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's okay. now it's perfect. Yes. Okay, so yeah, um, you've already given some kind of introduction, but I thought I would uh, start the lecture with uh, a bit of a history about Cambridge Econometrics and, uh, and also E3ME. Uh, then uh, I would talk about how the model is used, who are the clients, what uh, types of projects we do. Then uh, talk a little bit more about the model itself, uh, its uh, modules. And then at the end, um, some applications of it really show you uh, um, real economy examples of, of how the model is used. And then uh, we would still have time for any questions that you may have or, or anyone uh, from the audience. So really to start with uh, Cambridge Econometrics, it, um, it started as a spin-off from the University of Cambridge, uh, Department of Applied Economics. 
the, it was part of the Cambridge Growth Project. They used the social accounting matrices. Uh, this is uh, really what how the input-output models uh, developed. And uh, then the, it was uh, uh, based on the spin-off, a uh, company was founded by the members of the department, and um, and the co uh, the company continues to develop the models, and we are still using the model that was developed in in the 1970s, um, and uh, using it and and developing it further. Um, uh, using more and more data as it historically becomes uh, available and also developing the model. So basically the, the company uh, focused mainly on the UK and mainly on forecasting services in the 1980s. Then um, in the 1990s, the work really expanded to meet the demands of new clients, uh, demands of, of Europe, uh, not just uh, the UK, and also not only forecasting services, but also local economic development, uh, energy and climate policy challenges. Uh, then, as uh, after the 1990s, more in the 2000s, the company grew from a small team of researchers to, to really a, a bigger company. And, um, and then at the end of uh, the 19. 10, 20, 25, um, global expansion has started. And uh, now we have offices in uh, four uh, geographical areas. So the headquarters is still in Cambridge in the UK, but uh, we have an office here in Budapest and we are focusing on uh, the Central Eastern European region. Um, uh, I can talk a little bit more about the types of projects we do. And, um, and we have an office in Brussels, mostly focusing on the European Commission work. And we just recently opened an office in uh, the US, uh, actually on the 1st of October. So what are the models that we are using? Um, first, we started with a multi-sector model of the UK economy. Um, so it was it is mainly an input-output model. And then in the 1999, uh, the first version of E3ME uh, was developed. The three E's stand for economy, environment, and energy. And it then covered 17 countries uh, and 28 industries. Um, since then, the, the model was extended to all EU member states. Uh, it also um, extended to cover new industries as well. And the aggregation, the sectoral aggregation is also further developed. Um, what we are doing now is also a continued development um, of the model. And uh, we are taking into account, for example, the new technologies, for example, the new solar um, energy production and how we are taking into account how the costs have uh, decreased over the past uh, recent years. And we are also uh, looking into regional disaggregation and also um, the effects on, on the employment market and how uh, not just focusing on, for example, the numbers of, of jobs uh, impacted by certain uh, policy decisions, but also on the skills and, and occupations. So what uh, types of jobs will be changing and what skills are needed uh, to be able to fulfill th those jobs is also part of uh, the modeling that we are doing. Um, the focus areas of, of the company are the three pillars of sustainability, so economy, society, and uh, environment. And also there are a few uh, topics that cut across these three uh, pillars. For example, we have been looking into uh, modeling uh, some megatrends, which, uh, which also look, looks at um, what types of innovations are, are done, uh, how the population is changing, uh, energy use, and we are also looking at sustainable investment that also cuts across these three areas, which uh, takes into account uh, how climate change impacts the financial sector. Uh, and the types of models uh, are, uh, I would say, make the company a kind of a matrix uh, structure. So the, the teams are uh, structured in a way that we have an economy team who are focusing on the topics of the economy, a society team and an environment team as well. Uh, I am myself part of the environment team and my background is, is uh, energy and climate policy. And we have a, a quite a big modeling team um, who are running the models to fulfill the questions that come up in, in these uh, topical areas. And uh, we, we work in collaboration between the teams as well as between the offices. Um, 
we also always work in, in collaboration and, uh, and uh, consortia with other partners. So um, I will say a few words about how the model is used and then I can mention, for example, what types of partners, what types of clients uh, we have and, and um, every project we do is aimed to publish the results in the public domain. So all of our uh, research results are available, uh, both on our website and also on the client's website. Uh, so basically we work for the many the directorates of the European Commission. Um, for example, the, the one study we have been doing is, is really looking at uh, what would happen if uh, the European trading, uh, emission trading system is extended to uh, maritime and shipping. We have been uh, looking at, and we are actually just now looking at the Fit for 55 package, which is a legislative uh, pro uh, proposal package by the European Commission focusing on how to achieve the, the, the increased ambition climate targets of the European Union. Um, um, we have been doing uh, just transition plans, for example, for DG reform, looking into um, ha what happens if the fossil uh, fuel-based production has to be phased out, what would happen in certain regions which are dependent uh, on, on coal, for example, which is quite relevant for, for Poland, and uh, what would that mean in terms of uh, what action plans can be done, what support the European uh, Commission is giving these countries, especially uh, certain regions, certain areas, but also on, on the level of um, the employment, who is affected, what types of jobs will be lost, but what types of jobs can be gained. So it was quite a, an extensive study that uh, we recently finished. Um, other types of projects that we are doing, um, NGOs and international organizations, um, we have been looking into the Digital Services Act. We have done an excellent assessment on, on what would be the European uh, added value if uh, there is a Digital Services Act in the EU. Um, most recently, we have been modeling uh, what would it mean to do a global green recovery. So now, uh, in times of COVID, it, it shouldn't be just about building back uh, and reconstructing or, or a recovery after the, the, the COVID crisis, but how can we make it a, a green recovery? What would it mean? What types of uh, actions are needed? What would it make? Um, how, how to make it a green recovery, but how to also make it an inclusive recovery. Um, we have been looking at this uh, both on the EU level, but also we have uh, done a, a separate study focusing only on the Visegrad countries. We have been doing, as, as I mentioned, uh, as part of our sustainable investment work stream, climate impact assessments. So basically climate stress testing for national banks, for um, Vast management uh, companies for investment banks on what exactly climate change would mean if you look at, for example, one portfolio. You might have an investment portfolio today that brings you revenue, but if there is climate action taken seriously, if there is decarbonization happening, how would, how would that portfolio change? What would it mean for certain sectors? What would it mean for certain countries? And basically, how can you expect the changes and what should you be doing now to be still uh, making a revenue in 2030, 2050? Um, also, we have done uh, studies for Poland already, um, on focusing on the Polish decarbonization, the, the road transport decarbonization that you can find on our website. And um, it's, it's also focusing on uh, passenger cars and also freight transport. But to look into uh, a bit more detail um, about our model. So basically, it's a simulation model. It uh, takes into account uh, the three E's, the three, the, the also the energy uh, sector, the economy and the climate in terms of the interlinkages between these. Um, and also most recently, we have been developing a, a technology submodule. So basically taking into account the R&D happening, uh, what does it mean for the technology costs? 
um, the energy uses and energy prices and taxes are linked with the economic activity. So uh, what we do is always simulating. Um, it's, we're not forecasting, we are not uh, saying um, this is what is going to happen. We are saying if there is a target, um, what might be possible uh, what might be possible pathways or scenarios to achieve that target. That's how we, we help our clients. Uh, so for example, if, um, if the European Commission wants to achieve um, a net zero um, target by 2050, that's, that's only a, a what you want to achieve, but how you achieve it is, is where E3ME can be used. And in um, coordination with the clients, we would then set quite a few scenarios. Uh, we would always have a baseline scenario, which would assume only those policies would be um, implemented that are already um, announced. So that uh, we always work from publicly available sources. We take into account the International Energy Agency's uh, uh, numbers, for example. So we would always compare to a baseline scenario, and then we would set up impact scenarios, which can range from one to 12 to as many as, as, uh, as the client would want. And uh, the model runs until 2100, but uh, we usually take the, the results until 2050. Um, how the, the model is set up, it covers 70 regions. Uh, now, all EU member states are covered uh, individually, uh, but also on an EU 27 level. We take into account uh, economic sectors and consumption categories, fuel users, and, and uh, many types of fuels. Uh, we are just developing a module for, for example, taking into account hydrogen. It's a, it's a very comprehensive model. It's a whole energy, environment, and economic system modeling. It has two-way feedbacks between each module and uh, can assess the impacts of policy instruments. Uh, the database covers uh, data uh, from 1970 to 2018, and uh, it is updated yearly as new data becomes available. We operate with 28 econometric equation sets, and these uh, relationships are validated. So it uh, allows for sh both short-term and medium and long-term analysis. It is based on the system of national accounting. We use input-output tables, um, but also take bilateral trade into account. And uh, the annual projections uh, are done yearly. Um, the behavioral equations uh, with effects from the previous outcomes, of course, uh, affect uh, going forward. So we usually do it uh, for ex ante scenario analysis, meaning that before um, um, a decision is made by uh, a national government or an international organization or the European Commission, then we would be able to assess what that uh, decision would mean. There have been some cases where we looked at uh, the decisions ex post that only required setting up a baseline that would have been a counterfactual. So what would have happened in uh, lack of this uh, policy decision, for example. It, um, it's, a, it's a modular uh, model, and um, I can talk a little bit more about this uh, FTT, the Future Technology Transformation Module, that's focusing on power generation, transport, heating, steel, and uh, the one for agriculture and hydrogen are in development. But I'll cover those in, in the next slide. Uh, just uh, a little bit of theory for the model. So it's a post-Keynesian uh, model. Um, it's, it's quite different from the mainstream approach in, in basically how we treat uh, uncertainty. So as opposed to other, for example, CG models, our model is not an optimization model, but it's a simulation model. And uh, it's, it's also demand driven. It, uh, perhaps this, uh, this slide shows you better how it's a, it's a demand driven model and uh, what activities are linked to each other and, and what happens inside the region and outside the region and how trade is taken into account, for example. So we start from uh, the demand 
um, which, um, which is linked to the industrial output, which uh, has an investment decision. What are the investment and production inputs that are needed to make that output possible? What is the employment effect? How, uh, what does that mean in terms of income for the households? But also on the other hand, we take we look at the uh, household expenditure. And uh, on the other side, we also look at government spending. Um, we always um, assume that uh, the government spending is, is, um, is used to fund these investment uh, decisions. And, um, and then we take imports and exports into account and, and that's how the trade um, is also covered. This is a very uh, schematic um, approach to show you how the model works. It's, um, it's, um, it's a very complex model. It, it takes um, quite some time and quite some um, computer memory to, to run the model, but um, trying to make it more visible and, and more accessible in, in a very uh, schematic way. Hope, hopefully that uh, makes it more easy to understand and more interesting to listen uh, to what we are doing with it. So further questions that we are taking into account, uh, not just um, energy, economy and environment, but also the labor market implications and uh, what makes our model different from other, from other models and optimization models is really that, uh, for example, unemployment is possible as opposed to optimization models where supply and demand is, is just uh, equal in, in all markets. Um, and the ECME allows for both involuntary and voluntary unemployment. And, um, and the other factor is the technology. So basically technological progress is part of the model and is a result of research and development and investments over time. And it also feeds back. So the future technology um, bottom-up models are linked to the main E3ME model, and they captured the emergence of new technologies where historical data is either lacking, like in new power generation technologies, or when historical data wouldn't help us to, to identify what might happen in the future, because what we have seen, for example, with the, with, uh, the wind and solar generation and how the costs have gone down, um, if we just looked at the, the historical data, that wouldn't really give us an estimation going forward. So what does it really mean? How, how do these diffusion models work? So it's, um, it's, it's, um, it's a best method that um, we have been uh, using. So basically taking into account that uh, how, how would um, a market look like? What does it mean uh, in terms of uh, the take up of a technology? So it, we take into account the, also the innovators who, who start to use a, a technology, but all, also later on the early adopters and the, the majority, and then what happens. Um, the technology diffusion, the yellow curve um, on the graph, follows usually an S-shaped um, curve, but of course depends on the existing technologies and also the lifetime of these technologies. What we also take into account is, um, is the investor decisions and the, the levelized costs of, of these technologies, which is the deciding factor of um, how, how the, the energy mix will be uh, made up. Basically, these costs decrease in line with global investments, and for example, in renewables, and move along the supply-demand curves for fossil fuels. These decisions have spillover effects and influence further decisions. So our scenarios are often past dependent, meaning that once there is a decision made that really affects the next steps and, and what might happen in the future. Um, a little bit more about how it is different from uh, the computable uh, general equilibrium models, what are the characteristics and, and applications. So whereas the CGE model would always assume perfect competition, E3ME um, wouldn't, but we take into account that the competition can be quite different by industry. A CGE model would um, assume a constant return on scale, on the other hand, E3ME has, a, has an assumption of a varying return of scale. The CGE models assume an optimal employment, 
and via this RME, in this RME, we can have unemployment. And CGE, there is always long-term planning, and uh, it takes into account a neoclassical approach where the, the actors are uh, have full information and always behave rationally. In E3ME, we, we use it for both short-term and long-term uh, analysis. We, we use a post-Keynesian approach. We always start with uh, the analyzed policies. We take into account the uncertainty. So we are not saying uh, that we are looking for uh, the optimal or the least cost solution, but we are saying uh, that we are comparing the possible outcomes to a baseline case. And then the differences can be compared to each other. And then we can say what might be the best approach to take. And what it means in practice, uh, it was interesting that uh, um, it already happened not once, but quite a few times that uh, the European Commission um, convened a research where both E3ME, but both other CGE models were um, used to analyze exactly the same uh, policies. And it was very interesting to see the, the differences in outcomes. And, also learn from the differences which might be attributable to the different assumptions in these models. And that also helped the commission to understand what it might mean um, when they set up a, a decision, when they uh, introduce a new policy and, and how uh, this affects the economy and the environment and the employment as well. So we are not saying that E3ME is a silver bullet. It has its own um, limitations and boundaries, but it's definitely used for uh, policy impact assessments. And um, I would like to give you a few examples of applying ISRIAMI to real world policies and trends. Um, and I already mentioned green recovery, and I thought automation might also be of interest um, as, as a recent um, uh, policy. Um, for the European Commission, for uh, DG Energy, we had a, quite a big three-year project looking at um, and, and also um, improving our modeling, looking at megatrends and how that those megatrends shape Europe's future. These megatrends were um, looking at what technology changes are happening in the future how globalization and the trade relations are going to affect uh, Europe's future, the demographic change and, and the different types of um, uh, country demographics within the EU, but also outside of the EU and, and how, the, how the different countries will be shaping, uh, and also material consumption. So we took into account uh, material prices, material efficiency, resource efficiency as well, but uh, here you can also think about, for example, if, we, if there is a shift to electric vehicles instead of uh, the, um, the traditional uh, ICEs, then um, what happens with uh, what lithium, for example. Um, to talk about the technology change scenario in particular, we looked at, um, uh, in a matrix structure, we set up uh, different scenarios. One scenario where there is a rapid progress and innovation and, and high level of automation, but in other scenarios we looked at there is less innovation taking place, um, automation is not really happening, um, how the governance um, follows this, what might uh, happen in terms of the regulatory framework to, to assess this. And, um, and we also looked at robotization. So basically these were the, the scenarios that we looked at. So we looked at what would be the investment um, in, in um, automization and robotization, what would be the jobs replaced due to automation, what would be total productivity due to automa uh, automation, and also uh, how the government needed to support these, the, the, to balance really the negative employment effect and what uh, this really means, the redistribution of, of uh, the revenues and uh, how the government action is needed to, to balance and, and make sure that um, 
the, the negative effects of automization are uh, countered. Um, what we have found, and on this graph, it's, um, it's, uh, you can see all the other scenario effects as well, uh, is basically that um, we saw that there is, uh, if, if redistribution happens, we can shift the negative employment impact into a positive GDP. Um, and, and basically me saying that, um, that the strong employment effect uh, can be um, compensated for. Whereas if you model a very similar scenario with a CG model, you would always get to a negative employment and a positive GDP. Another uh, scenario analysis that we have done uh, for the United Nations Environment Program and uh, the ILO, the, the labor um, organization, was focusing on modeling the green recovery, so really how to um, build back better after COVID. Uh, in this, we, we looked at um, a scenario um, we, we compared two scenarios, one where the, the recovery was just uh, the traditional way of, of recovering and, and uh, the other scenario was focusing on uh, green, employ green uh, recovery, green measures. And we also took into account the rebound effects of these, um, of these measures and uh, what would it mean if, if uh, the government is also spending more and more money and how the, the, the funding is, uh, is used and uh, taken up. Um, we also looked at uh, uh, and compared um, a short term, um, we called it a rescue relief program and compared it with uh, a long term recovery program. Um, this, is, this is really the, the categorization, what does it mean to, to have a green recovery, what makes a recovery green. Um, so basically, this matrix can show you what might be the short term implications, what might be if a government is only focusing on, on building back better uh, quickly. Uh, there are uh, colorless ways to do this, uh, is really which doesn't have an environmental effect, that's how it's, um, it's characterized. It can be a gray solution, which means that uh, it has an environmental harm and it creates excess carbon emissions. Some examples can be, for example, the bailouts for the airline companies, the oil and gas companies, and the automotive manufacturing companies. Whereas what constitutes a green uh, rescue package is really um, where not only the economic uh, impacts are taken into account, but the environmental harm is reduced. Um, emissions are mitigated and, and growth is sustainable. Some examples can be a support for more public transport uh, companies, really more uh, train operators. But what we did, we, we looked at the long-term um, recovery package. It's, it's really to create new jobs, replacing the old ones, rebuilding the economy and reshaping the economy. So really a, a structural, structural change would happen. And what means, uh, what green means in, in that sense is uh, more support for renewable deployment, uh, incentivizing electric vehicles, uh, focusing on energy efficiency investments, also afforestation and reforestation, and, uh, and really um, boosting and spending carbon-free technologies, R&D and ecosystem uh, regeneration. So this is basically the, the structure that we used, and this is how we came up with, um, with the uh, measures that were taken into account in our model. And we did two scenarios. In one scenario, we basically just decreased the VAT, uh, meaning that if VAT is less, then people would consume more. So this is just a consumption uh, boosting recovery, which would not affect the, um, the revenues of, of government because then it would be uh, compensated for. And on the other hand, we had a, a green recovery uh, policy where we would uh, still have a bit of VAT decrease, but there were four uh, policy measures that we took into account as green policies for the recovery, focusing on uh, more renewables, subsidies for the electric vehicles, 
reforestation and investment in energy efficiency. And what we have found is really um, not only in terms of GDP, um, as you can see on, on the left-hand side, um, every region was uh, impacted uh, more positively in the green recovery uh, scenario, but also on the impacts on employment, which you can see on the right-hand side. Um, it might be too, uh, yeah, too small for you to see what, can, what are the sectors that are impacted, but, um, but basically only the extractive industries are the ones that are uh, negatively impacted, as, as you can imagine, uh, mining, um, uh, for example, but all the other sectors are uh, positively impacted uh, going forward. So basically agriculture and, and forestry business services, as well as construction, especially in the beginning of, of the of the analyzed period as you need uh, construction for um, rebuilding, but also manufacturing and the public services. And we have also done a heat map for example, uh, looking at the employment change and, uh, and uh, the green recovery impacts on global employment in these sectors. And as you can see in the very short term, although uh, the effects of COVID um, were quite negative on accommodation and food services and other services and transport, for example, but in the long run, if you look, at, uh, look ahead only two, three years, uh, you can see that only the extractive industries are the ones that are negatively impacted and all the other sectors are almost non-impacted or small positive change. So in that sense, um, the highly disaggregated sec sectoral structure of ESRIEME really helps and uh, we could take into account the jobs that were affected adversely by the, the pandemic and, and which are the sectors, which are the jobs that are really vulnerable. So that's all I really uh, wanted to say. And, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. And, and also wanted to say that um, we, are, we are always um, open to, to new applications and, uh, and we actually have um, uh, an economic modeler position um, hiring open. So if, um, if uh, our company and, and what uh, we do made uh, you interested in, in our company, our services, then feel free to reach out and look at our, on our website for any vacancies. Great. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for the presentation. Uh, it was very informative um, and a great, great overview of the company. Um, so if, if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to, uh, to ask them or write them in the chat. Um, and I guess, uh, I would maybe like to, um, start with one question, um, regarding, regarding the company. Um, so how to start working for Cambridge Econometrics and, uh, what, what skills and, uh, other competencies are you looking for? Thanks. Um, was the first question how I started working for the company? Uh, or when yeah, you could. Yeah, that, that's actually a good question. So <laughs> if you could tell about yourself, and then how would you rec What path would you recommend for a person that would be interested in working for Cambridge Econometrics? Mm -hmm. Thanks. So yeah, um, most of our um, most of our staff are economists by background. And um, yeah, you have to be, you have to like numbers uh, to, to like to work at uh, Cambridge Econometrics. Um, our mission is really to make the, the results very digestible, easy to understand. So instead of uh, just Excel sheets, um, we would try to provide really executive summaries with key action points and, and uh, infographics and, and uh, very short summaries for policymakers, for example. We, I think uh, that's very important. That's also our motto. It, it says uh, clarity from complexity. So we use our very complex model, but try to make it clear for the clients. Uh, how I started, um, I, um, I did my uh, master's study in uh, Budapest in uh, the University of Economics, Corvinus University, and um, 
And then I did a PhD in environmental economics. And um, I spent one year in the US doing uh, research. Um, and from there, I, I, I went to Cambridge and uh, worked for a, a very similar but uh, more policy focused um, research organization and then joined Cambridge Econometrics. Um, in Cambridge, I, I lived in Cambridge, but then moved back to Budapest and, uh, and opened the, the, the Budapest office um, three years ago, three and a half years ago now. So it was a very small office. I started from my own uh, study room at home, but now we have a, an office of uh, eight people in a nice business center. And, uh, and so if anyone is interested to apply, um, the one of the, the aims of the Budapest office is, is to do more in our region. Um, I think it's important for um, that our colleagues, for example, come from this region in the Budapest office and we understand the issues in this region. Uh, we understand um, it's more about energy security rather than climate change. Uh, if, if you want to talk to a policymaker uh, either in Poland or Hungary. Um, and it, it was always interesting when I talked to my British colleagues and, and they come from a very different setting and very different uh, understanding and, and the environment and climate change have already been on the agenda there for many, many years. Whereas here, it's, um, it's something that is in people's minds and awareness, I think more recently. So uh, it's also interesting, but it's very diverse. It's, it's very international. Um, the company is very international, but also the types of uh, clients are very international and the types of projects are very diverse as well. Uh, I quite like that every project I learned something new. Some projects range from three months to three years. Um, I always say that we are basically somewhere between a mainstream economic consultancy and an academic research institute. So we, we strive for academic robustness. We publish our results in academic journals, but, um, but it's also uh, business oriented and, and we focus on, on the client's needs. Right. Um, and I would like to follow up on uh, what you've said. Uh, at what point uh, did you learn the methodologies that are being used by the E3ME model? Because in, in many university courses, um, the, the probably the, the top level of the models that you get to are like these G models or CGE models, whereas the simulation models are not as common to mm -hmm. be taught at the academia. So um, at what point uh, and how did you learn that? <laughs> Yeah, I learned it here <laughs> at the company, and uh, and we say that if um, so, I am myself not using, not running the model, but my colleagues are, and we say it's usually half a year to really be able to understand and run it uh, without supervision. So it's very complex, but. Um, but yeah, the, the main theory behind it is, is something that everyone learns as, as, as we join the company. But there right. are many, many mm -hmm. trainings within the company, both in person, both online, now many with COVID and the home working, now many uh, recordings are available, for example. Mm -hmm. So uh, what quantitative background uh, would be needed uh, to get into Cambridge Econometrics if, if not the methodologies that are used in the models themselves, then is it uh, CGE modeling or is it the knowledge of how these three work or just econometrics in general? But if uh, if you have some econometrics background, that's useful, but not a must. Um, a very logical thinking is definitely required. Uh, quantitative um, yeah, preference for quantitative methods is also um a positive and um, now we are switching to use python it's not a must but it makes uh, a new uh, staff life much easier if you already know python yeah that's what i would say also wanting being curious is, is something i would add if if, uh, if you are curious if you want to understand how the model works if you want to 
understand what a research question the model can answer because it can't answer all types of model, uh, research questions. Um, and, and when um, the results from the model come out in an Excel uh, file, and then you have, you have to be able to understand whether you've made a mistake, is it robust enough? Does it make sense? Can it be a negative number? So these kind of um, questioning uh, is, is, is also uh, useful. Right. Um, and what does set the model apart from other models made by other think tanks? Uh, and by that, I mean, like, can you specify that the, the most advantageous component of the E3ME model? Is it just the number of the sectors that it like, uh, um, you know, uh, disaggregates into or is it something else? Yeah, so from the CG models, it's definitely the, the that we don't uh, assume all the neoclassical uh, assumptions. What we learn at the uni in university about the microeconomics, it yeah, it doesn't work really in reality, um, or that's not how it works in reality. Um, so in that sense, that this model takes reality more into account, I would say that's the most advantageous uh, feature of it. But also, yeah, what you said about the, the number of regions, number of sectors, so it's, it's highly desegregated, which makes it, uh, of course, quite complex and, and, uh, and the running times short, uh, long. But, um, but yeah, I would say this is, this is the most advantageous part of it. And that it can be used for many types of, uh, of research questions and policy questions. Right. Um, so I guess just, just uh, one last follow-up question on uh, your previous answers. Um, so was it your idea to expand the company into Hungary or how did it look like? Because you said you were the only person. For yeah, working. it's an interesting question. So I was uh, the only person here. Um, and, um, and then Brexit happened. And, uh, and then my, um, yeah, my, the UK colleagues were, we were talking about uh, opening a Brussels office because um, I would say half of, of the company's projects and revenue come from the European Commission. And we were concerned that if the, um, if the UK leaves the EU, then we might not be able to uh, apply for EU projects. But then the whole process of setting up a company in Brussels was uh, much more administrative, long, took longer, was more expensive. And then at some point we, we said, why, why not do it in Hungary? Uh, it's easy to set up an, an LTD. Uh, we have quite good uh, economics um, university programs. Uh, we will be able to find a good pool of economists for a reasonable uh, cost or at, at lower cost than what we do in, in the UK, for example. And um, so we gave it a try and, uh, and it, it, it became successful. And, um, and now part of, of what we are doing is also making sure that the name is better known. So, so not, just, uh, not just what types of projects we do and what clients we work for, but that, um, for example, in, in Poland, Hungary, Romania, Czech Republic, uh, people would understand that um, it's not Cambridge Analytica, for example, the very always the question that uh, when I introduced the company in the beginning, and luckily it's uh, happening uh, less frequently now. Um, so, so yeah, now we have, um, for example, some, some ongoing project and, and collaboration with Czech partners, Romanian partners, uh, as I mentioned, we finished two Polish studies. Um, so really, that's, that's one of the aims now. Right. Thanks a lot. Well, the, uh, the prerequisites seem seem like uh, there could be a branch opening in Poland <laughs> in sometime in the future. Yeah, many uh, people ask us why not Poland. Um, yeah. Um, right. I have a question in the chat here uh, from Jakub. It's a bit more technical. Mm -hmm. uh, he says that around uh, slide number twenty. There is the overview of input outputs and the taxes were not present. Um, if, it, if you could 
if that is correct, if you yeah, put it the right way. It wasn't, um, you're right. I mentioned, as I mentioned, it, they really just wanted to uh, have a very schematic representation of the model. Mm -hmm. okay. um, taxes are one type of, uh, of policy measure uh, that we can model and, and look at the impacts of. So it can be subsidies, it can be uh, taxes, it can be um, uh, any other types of policy measures. Sure. Um, so uh, actually, I would like to follow up on that. So where, where do models such as eFreeMe take data from? Um, is it some um, like the national main statistical mm -hmm. offices yeah, or, national yeah. statistical offices eurostat oecd databases mm -hmm. um for for example for value added trade um iea international energy agency uh, most of our uh, baseline is based on the iea's uh, different scenarios uh, so only publicly available sources right. um, is there any micro data used in the model as well like on a, a survey level, for example, or something like that? Uh, survey level, no, not really. But uh, for them, there have been projects where we work with a partner. For example, they would be doing stakeholder engagement. They, they could be doing surveys. And, and then uh, we would link uh, the two together. Or sometimes when we set up a scenario, when we design how the scenario should look like, then we have partners who would do a survey or, or now we are looking at um, what would be the impact of, uh, of producing electric vehicles um, within the Visegrad region, um, assuming that it's going to uh, take up and, and more decarbonization is happening. And for that, we, we have set up a stakeholder group, for example, and, uh, and there that's micro data that's shaping the, the scenarios and the assumptions going into the model. Right. Okay. Um, thanks a lot. I uh, don't see any more questions on the chat unless someone wants to ask any. Uh, there are also none on Facebook uh, from what I see. Um, so yes, unless uh, no one else has any questions, then uh, I guess we will be uh, finishing now. Um, right, so, well, I would like to thank you once again uh, for holding the lecture and for introducing the E3ME model and Cambridge econometrics into uh, our university audience. Um, so that, that, that's really great. I, I've wanted to do that for quite some time to um, let more people know about the, the company and the model because it, it really seems like something that universities should be teaching towards as well. Um, so yeah, um, yeah we thank have you once again. Research collaborations with universities. Mm -hmm. so we are very open to it. And thanks very much for the invitation. It was an honor. Right. Sure. Thank you very much. And uh, well, I guess with that, we will be concluding the ninth Congress of Microeconomics. Uh, so I would like to take everyone uh, for uh, their attendance, for their questions during these and the previous meetings. Um, and we will see you next year as the Congress is an annual event for the 10th edition. Uh, hopefully we'll manage to uh, keep the same or better um, level. Uh, so thank you once again, uh, everybody. And we are now officially closing the ninth Congress of Macroeconomics. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Dr. Fazekas, for being here. Thank you.